What are you most excited for people to see as they watch this docuseries? Well, I just feel like they'll be able to learn a little bit more about the person, you know, and whether it's me, JJ, George, um, Amon Ra, or, uh, or Debo, whoever it is, they'll be able to learn more about what goes into, you know, us being the players that we are on the field, um, whether it's our support system, you know, um, you know, our work ethic, the, the way we practice, the way we watch the tape, and, you know, you, you, you saw what a, what a typical week is like, so it's kind of a lot of the stuff that goes into, you know, our, our job, so... Obviously, there's a lot more than just us that contribute to that as well. So it's good to see some of the some of the outside things and, you know, outside interests we have, things that our kids are up to, a little bit of everything. Yeah, I think people are going to love that. I mean, so many of you guys are known for what you do on the field, but there's so much more to you and a lot of depth, as you mentioned. Now, you are, though, always going to be one of the top receivers as long as you're in this league. And the wide receiver market has absolutely exploded since you entered the NFL in 2014. Calvin Johnson was the highest paid that year, a little over $16 million per year. Now, as you know, yeah. Justin Jefferson just signed a deal for $35 million a year. Uh, what do you think yeah. that says, Devontae, about the importance of the wide receiver position in today's game? Well, I mean, the, the market's only moving because the, the position's getting better. I mean, year after year, I was just talking to somebody earlier today, and, um, you know, when I first got in the league, there was really only, like, three guys that were at the top of the league. And, um, you know, I, I like to think that, I mean, we're looking at these numbers right here with Julio. I remember in 19 thinking that $22 million a year was just absolutely insane, and that was a boost that he got to get there. And then looking at, you know, Justin now making – quarterback money is is absurd and I mean it's, it's great for the position and, and I'm happy to see it because I just want to I want people to understand just how much goes into our position and just how valuable we are especially when you are you know one of the best at your position you know you, you obviously deserve to get uh get compensated as such yeah and uh, you've got a couple more years on your deal but I'm sure it'll just keep compounding by the time you're going to get paid again too which is good <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, listen, the Raiders had a busy offseason. How important was it to the team that Antonio Pierce remained the head coach of your team? I mean, it was it was imperative for us. I mean, you saw guys like me, Josh Jacobs, Max Crosby. I mean, pretty much everybody. Rob Spillane. We all were, you know, harping on how important it was to, to have him come back. And, I mean, he showed it himself. It wasn't too much that needed to be said, but... Um, anything that, that he didn't show, we definitely went in and, and talked to Mark or anybody else that was a part of that decision um, just so that they understood. You know, Mark isn't in the building every day, Mark uh, Davis, that is. He's not in the building every single day, so he may miss a few things that, you know, we definitely won't and things that we can share and shed light on um, to ensure that we got that spot. And, I mean, from one week to the next, when, when he wasn't the head coach to when he was the interim, I mean, you saw a drastic difference mm. as, as far as what out of the same players that you saw a week ago that, that weren't contributing the way that they were. Um, you know, you get somebody in there that can kind of get a hold of, of the of the locker room and, and lead men the way that he can. I mean, that's a, that's a very critical piece to being a head coach. So, um, obviously, he was, he was the most deserving guy for it. Yeah, you know, you're somebody that doesn't pay a whole ton of attention to the media, I know, but I'm sure you were aware that your name was out there. People were saying, you know, maybe Devontae would leave. Instead, you reaffirmed your commitment to this Raiders organization. What are your expectations for this group this season and why you really wanted to stick around to continue it on there in Vegas? Well, I don't have any expectations as far as how many games I'm expecting to win. I just expect, based off the talent that we have, for us to maximize it this year. There's no excuses. It's, it's I mean, we, we got everything that we need um, just about and just keep keep putting the pieces together, keep working together and, you know, to, to be the team that we're supposed to be. I mean, we show flashes, even the 22 year um, under Josh McDaniels, we show flashes of being a great football team. We obviously didn't end up with as many wins as we would have liked to have. But when you look at the way that even the, the, the losses that we had, you look at the way we lost those games, it was, you know, by a, a very slim margin and you know, we were in every single game, just didn't finish them the way we needed to. So mm -hmm. this team has a lot of promise. We just got to find a way to finish better and start faster. And I think we'll be uh, we'll be OK. We'll be uh, put ourselves in a good position. Yeah, some people wondered if the Raiders would take a quarterback in the draft and instead they stick with Aiden O'Connell and uh, Gardner Minshew joining the fold. What have you seen so far this offseason from the quarterbacks? A lot of competition and not even amongst each other, just 
competing to be better every single day. And that's really all you can ask from guys, you know, like Aiden, who obviously doesn't have much experience. You know, the world's trying to beat up on him and say he's not able to do it. And, you know, I'd say the same thing I, you know, I said earlier. At the end of the day, if you wanted to say a guy's first year is going to determine what his career is going to be like, then you would have never, you know, look, you would have never thought that you and I would be having this conversation about me being on a docu-series about, you know, playing this position. So at the end of the day, you got to you got to lock in on these guys, give them give them chances. And, you know, that's exactly what I'm doing. You guys recently had your media day photo shoot for the Raiders. What would you think of the photos of Minshew? I mean, once you get to know, once you get to know Gardner, it's it's really not, it's really not a surprise. I mean, that's the type of guy he is. I love that he. I mean, he got the Uncle Rico going right there from Napoleon Dynamite. Like that's that's exactly who he is, and we appreciate him driving his, his little van that he lives in and, and his whole little weird deal that he does things. It's not my style, but I, I love that he is who, who he is, and he, he sticks to that. Philadelphia Eagles Perspective 1. Depth and Versatility The Eagles have constructed an enviable arsenal in the secondary. Howie Roseman's acumen in assembling a squad brimming with talent and flexibility is nothing short of masterful. With rising stars like Quinion Mitchell and Cooper DeJean, we're talking about a secondary teaming with potential and versatility. Dijon's ability to seamlessly switch between corner, slot, and safety roles makes him an invaluable asset, diminishing the urgency to hold onto Bradbury, who, let's face it, is on the other side of 30. 2. Development of Young Corners Kali Ringo's meteoric rise has been a revelation. The young corner, thrust into the spotlight due to Darius Slay's injury last season, showcased a maturity and skill set well beyond his years. Coupled with Isaiah Rogers' impressive offseason performance, it's clear the Eagles' secondary is in robust health. Rogers, despite a year-long suspension, has shown he hasn't missed a beat, adding further depth and competition. 3. Future Asset Acquisition Trading Bradbury for a third-day draft pick, even one slated for 2026, aligns perfectly with Roseman's long-term vision. This strategy of accruing future assets ensures the Eagles remain competitive and adaptable in the seasons to come. It's a forward-thinking approach that keeps the pipeline of talent and opportunity flowing. Pittsburgh Steelers' Perspective 1. Immediate Need for Veteran Leadership The suspension of Cameron Sutton has left a gaping hole in the Steelers' secondary. Enter James Bradbury. His wealth of experience and consistent performance make him an ideal candidate to step in and provide the stability and leadership Pittsburgh desperately needs. His track record speaks for itself, with at least one interception in each of his eight NFL seasons. 2. Versatility and Reliability Bradbury's ability to play both outside and in the slot adds a layer of tactical flexibility to the Steelers' defense. This versatility is invaluable, especially with the dynamic challenges posed by modern NFL offenses. His presence would undoubtedly elevate the overall performance of the Steelers' secondary. 3. Strategic Acquisition Timing For the Steelers, acting now rather than playing the waiting game is crucial. Acquiring Bradbury before the season allows for a full training camp and preseason integration, ensuring he's fully acclimated to the team's defensive schemes and culture. It's a strategic move that minimizes disruption and maximizes readiness. General Analysis 1. Bradbury's Fit The potential trade of Bradbury to the Steelers appears to be a mutually beneficial scenario. For the Eagles, it alleviates the congestion in the secondary and garners future draft capital. For the Steelers, it addresses an immediate and critical need with a seasoned veteran. 2. Eagles' Defensive Evolution Nick Sirianni's consideration of moving Bradbury to safety highlights the innovative and flexible mindset within the Eagles' coaching staff. 
However, given the depth and versatility already present, trading Bradbury seems the most pragmatic and advantageous path. 3. Long-Term Implications This perspective move underscores a sophisticated approach to roster management, balancing present capabilities with future prospects. It's a blueprint that other teams might emulate, blending immediate performance needs with strategic foresight. Conclusion As Arden Eagles fans, we should be ecstatic about the shrewd maneuvering and strategic foresight exhibited by our front office. This potential trade not only fortifies our long-term prospects, but also ensures our secondary remains one of the most formidable units in the league. For the Steelers, securing Bradbury could be the linchpin in solidifying their defensive backfield and propelling them to divisional dominance. This is a textbook example of astute NFL roster management at its finest. Fly, Eagles, fly. Eagle. CBV anuncia convocadas da seleção feminina de vôlei para as Olimpíadas. Confederação Brasileira de Vôlei está divulgando os nomes ao longo desta quinta-feira nas redes sociais. Veja as primeiras. O Brasil está conhecendo aos poucos a lista de convocadas do vôlei feminino para as Olimpíadas. Nesta quinta-feira, a Confederação Brasileira de Vôlei, CBV, começou a revelar nas redes sociais os primeiros nomes selecionados pelo técnico José Roberto Guimarães. Entre as primeiras escolhas está a capitã Gabi, que foi destaque na Liga das Nações. Além da ponteira, a Libero Niene e as centrais Carol, Thaís e Diana também foram anunciadas. Gabi é uma jogadora que promete ser essencial para o Brasil nas Olimpíadas. Pela Liga das Nações Feminina, o último teste antes dos Jogos, a ponteira e capitã foi a terceira maior pontuadora da competição com 249 pontos. Já a Central Carol se destacou como maior bloqueadora do torneio. Niemi também foi bem, ocupando a segunda posição no ranking de defensoras, com 167 bolas salvas. Apesar do bom desempenho de algumas jogadoras, a seleção terminou em quarto lugar, fora do pódio. O Brasil também vai contar com a experiência da bicampeã olímpica Thaisa. A central de 37 anos começou a Liga das Nações Feminina no banco, se recuperando de uma lesão no pé e em tratamento de dores no joelho. Ela estreou na competição só na segunda semana contra o Japão. Ainda assim, Thaisa mostrou que faz a diferença e foi decisiva no bloqueio e na liderança da equipe. Para a ansiedade dos torcedores, a confederação divulgará os nomes aos poucos nas redes sociais. Os nomes estão sendo apresentados através de vídeos com famosos brasileiros anunciando as jogadoras. A previsão é de que a convocação seja completamente divulgada até o final desta quinta-feira. É isso, galera. Mais notícias, continue por dentro do nosso canal.